is important for what it tells us about how science is done. Now once the structure was discovered it seemed like an obvious solution and that's usually what happens in scientific discoveries. A lot of people have different theories and hypotheses and there's a lot of new information and finally someone looks at it and says oh it's like this and it seems obvious at that point but I want you to remember that there's a long story of different people researching and making their own pro discoveries along the way that lead to this scientific progress. And so that's really a, a textbook case of this, is the discovery of DNA and its structure. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Now the story usually starts with a guy named Gregor Mendel. And you, you'll hear a lot about him in the coming days, so don't worry too much about the details. But he was a monk and in his youth he had studied science and actually studied astronomy was very interested in experimenting and when he became the abbot at his monastery he had his own special experimental garden where he ex planted different strains of peas and these peas had different characteristics some of them had yellow yellow peas some of them had produced green peas some of the plants had different types of flowers some of the plants were tall and some were stunted or short dwarf plants and so on and he would mix the pollen of different peas and plant the seeds that came up as a result and get different kinds of plants with different traits. And through years of careful experimenting with this, he was able to come up with a lot of predictable patterns and laws about how the peas, how different plants would be bred. And so Mendel determined that there was probably some unknown factor at work, a hereditary factor that causes certain traits to get passed on from parents to their offspring in certain ways. You don't become a carbon copy of your mother or, a, or your father. You're not an exact duplicate of each one, but you have a lot of characteristics of both of them. And you also have some unique combinations that are truly your own. And Gregor Mendel wanted to find out how this happens. He wrote up his findings and unfortunately no one really paid attention to him or his ideas for the next 50 years. However, during this time, more evidence was coming forth that there was some single factor at work. Frederick Griffith did an experiment where he took, there were two versions of a bacteria. One was non-virulent, the rough strain, and then there was a smooth strain that was virulent. And the rough strain was harmless, the smooth strain was lethal to mice. He killed a sample of the smooth strain, the dangerous ones, and injected the dead bacteria into a mouse and of course the mouse was not harmed and several mice he tried this on and they were unharmed by the dead bacteria so he thought okay whatever was dangerous in these bacteria it's been killed then he mixed the rough strain bacteria with the heat killed smooth strain so the harmful bacteria were dead and they were just mixed in with live bacteria that were known to be harmless and this combination inevitably killed the mice now Frederick Griffith thought there's something in the dead bacteria that's not dead that still has power to actually transform harmless bacteria into killer bacteria. So he thought there must be some transforming principle that is something of a physical nature because it doesn't it, it works even when the organism that houses it is no longer living. So these dead bacteria could pass on their characteristics to live bacteria. They could transform it. So this hereditary factor that Mendel talked about and this transforming principle puzzled a lot of scientists and over the years more and more research was done and they began to narrow in on what exactly was causing this phenomenon. There is a Swiss biochemic named, biochemist named Friedrich Meischler and he would collect bandages from hospitals that were just soaked with pus and from the pus he would isolate the nucleus of the white blood cells. They happen to have very large nuclei and from these nuclei, he, would, he found certain chemicals that were very high in phosphorus. These eventually became known as nucleic, nucleic acids, and it was thought that the nucleic acids must have something to do with this um, factor that caused certain traits to get passed on. Other biologists said, no, 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 it has to be protein. And this is a reasonable argument. If you've probably seen over the last few weeks, protein does everything inside of a cell, inside of a living organism. Almost every process you can name, protein plays a principal role. So why not in reproduction as well? But there's a problem in that proteins don't actually change so that you'd think a mother would have a baby, the baby would be an exact copy of the mother if, if protein was the only governing factor. 
People could never tell whether the transforming factor was protein or nucleic acids. Then along came another scientist, Oswald Avery, who thought he could solve the protein or DNA question. He did a lot of experiments with bacteria, much like Griffith, but he took another twist to it. In his day, enzymes were available that could actually dissolve protein, and he used these to remove the protein from the dead bacteria, the dead smooth bacteria, and then he mixed them together. And he wanted to see if bacteria without protein could transform the harmless bacteria into harmful ones. Now this transformation continued. So dead bacteria were still able to transform the live bacteria even though they had had their proteins removed. So Avery concluded, okay, protein is not the transformation factor here. So what is? He used other enzymes that break down the DNA and was able to remove the DNA from the bacterial cells. And ooh, when he did this, the transformation no longer occurred. So Avery concluded that it was DNA and not protein that was the hereditary factor that allowed traits to get passed on. Now the Hershey Chase experiment did something similar. We've got, we can zoom in on it here so you can see this experiment up close with this diagram. Hershey and Chase were two scientists who worked with these viruses called bacteriophages. That means they eat bacteria. And a virus is basically mostly protein. It's The bacteriophages have these structures kind of like legs or kind of like landing gear that are made out of protein and they match or lock up with proteins on the surface of the cell of a bacteria. And then inside they've got this capsule here which is also made out of protein. And inside the capsule is some DNA so essentially a bacteriophage is really just a capsule of protein with some DNA inside and not much else. Now there are radioactive isotopes of sulfur and sulfur is found in the proteins of these bacteriophages. Hershey and Chase grew bacteriophages in a medium that had this radioactive sulfur and pretty soon there were, they had bacteriophages who were tagged with radioactive sulfur in their proteins. They repeated this process with a radioactive isotope of phosphorus and pretty soon they had all these bacteriophages that had DNA that was tagged with radioactive phosphorus. Now all that remained was to expose the bacteria to these bacteriophages and see what was getting passed on. If they found a radioactive marker for phosphorus that would show them that the DNA had passed into the bacterial cell. If they found one for protein, if they found radioactive sulfur that would show that the protein had been passed on. And what they found was inside the bacteria there was radioactive phosphorus but no radioactive sulfur. This showed them that the DNA was entering the bacteria and not the protein. Chase and Hershey essentially confirmed what Avery had determined that it's the DNA and not the protein that is the hereditary factor in life. Once this was known to be the case, people began to look at, okay, how does, pro how does DNA work then? And two people, Francis Crick and James Watson, turned out to be the ones who got most of the credit for this final discovery. Now to show you the kind of challenges that Crick and Watson and other people who were working on this problem were facing, let's look a little bit at the structure of DNA. DNA is basically made of these four different nucleotides, which are types of chemicals. And we've got adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And if you, re if you notice, there's two classes of chemicals. The adenine and guanine are called purines, and the cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. And you don't need to memorize all this today. You're going to see these chemicals a lot in the upcoming lessons, so you'll probably just memorize it by default. But if you want to memorize A, G, C, T, that's okay. You'll have to do it eventually, but today it's not important. I've crossed out uracil because that plays a role later on, but it's not a part of DNA. If we look up close, this is adenine, which you just saw as one, of the as one of the purines on the previous page. Only here we've added a sugar to the adenine, and that makes it into something known as adenosine. And then we've got two phosphate groups, and what you're looking at is adenosine diphosphate, or the uncharged battery in the energy metabolism of a cell. So DNA and ADP are based on similar molecules. The guanine, in turn, is much like GDP. So if you imagine adding another phosphate group here, you would have adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. The reason I'm showing you this is just to emphasize how nature and life are able to take 
just a few molecules and apply them to a lot of different processes. Here we've got our adenine again up here, and here's that sugar that's attached to it. And you'll notice there's also a phosphate group here. Now check this out. We've got sugar and phosphate, sugar and phosphate. Every nucleotide has its sugar and its phosphate attached. And when the sugar and phosphate bind with each other, they form very strong covalent bonds. And this forms the backbone of DNA. They say DNA has a sugar phosphate backbone. But there was a big misunderstanding in the time of Watson and Crick. We've got our sugar phosphate backbone here, which they thought was in the center of the DNA, standing up like a big flagpole with all the other nucleotides kind of hanging off of it all around it in a circle. This structure created some problems because no one could really understand how it worked, how it was able to copy itself, how it coded any information. It was a big problem and it was soon to be solved. Another person working on the structure of DNA was Maurice Wilkins. Now Maurice Wilkins had another approach. You probably remember that protein and other organic molecules, when they're dried up, can form crystal forms. And if you run x-rays through these crystals, you can interpret the patterns that, are, that form when the x-rays get diffracted. And if you know what you're doing, you can actually use this process, which is called x-ray crystallography, to determine the structure of different organic molecules. Maurice Wilkins was kind of a leader in his time at doing this. And he was using x-ray crystallography on DNA, along with one of his partners, Rosalind Franklin. She's a really important name. Now, Rosalind Franklin was an expert at x-ray crystallography. She just had great techniques for using it and was very good at interpreting the results. And she was working with a PhD student, Raymond Gosling, when they developed this photo called Photo 51 that Rosalind Franklin helped Gosling create. I wish I could show you Photo 51 because it would make this whole story clearer. I don't have permission to use it in my video, but I did include a link down below where you can see the Photo 51. And so I suggest, I, I recommend you click on that either now, pause the video, or watch it afterwards to see what everyone else was seeing. Now Maurice Wilkins, who was kind of supervising Rosalind and, and Gosling, he actually took this photo and showed it to James Watson. There are a lot of different thoughts about why he did this or how he did this. Maybe it was just an innocent scientist sharing his information. Some people say that he actually had it in and didn't get along well with Rosalind Franklin. But at any rate, this photo, which was a very clear picture of the structure of DNA, was shown to James Watson. And he knew enough about crystalline x-ray crystallography to know exactly what it was. It was not a single backbone like we were looking at before but it was what's called a double helix, which means two spirals winding around each other. So now Watson went back to Crick, and they had a new set of information and a new problem. So they realized that DNA had two sugar phosphate backbones, not one, but two. And they also realized that DNA consisted of a double helix. But this didn't solve the mystery. This actually created another problem, as you might see. Now Watson and Crick did this really wacky thing that other people thought was quite eccentric, but they actually made physical models of the molecules. So they'd put a bunch of wires together and make this hexagon structure, and they'd get two of those, and they'd have themselves a guanine or an adenine, different purines. And they also wired together these um, sort of models of phosphorus and sugar and made the backbones. And they tried all, all these different models, and they had a big problem with this new double helix structure. Now adenine, remember, it's the purines have these double hexagon shapes, so they're essentially twice as long as the pyrimidines. So when you put adenine and guanine together, they butt up against each other, and yet cytosine and thymine can't reach. And when they experimented with different models, what they found was their sugar phosphate backbone just got all bent out of shape and got all buckled and bulgy, and it just made a big mess. And they thought, okay, we do not have the answer. There's something more to this that we're missing. You probably know, but remember, at the time, this was new information. What happened next was that another researcher around this same time was looking at DNA from a whole different perspective. Erwin Chargaff 
analyze the DNA of hundreds of different animal species to try to see if there was any kind of pattern, and he did discover a pattern. Right here we're looking at yeast, and you can see that the DNA in a yeast was made up of 31.3% adenine and 32, almost 33% thymine, and so on. And then we've got our guanine and cytosine. You're looking at a yeast and a crab, and you can see the, the composition of DNA, the percent of each nucleotide, was very different in these two species. And he noticed as he looked at different species, they were all very different. And yet there was a pattern that showed up everywhere. If you look, there's almost exactly the same amount of adenine as there is thymine. And that's true for the crab as well as for the yeast. I'm only going to show you a few examples, but Chargoff had hundreds of these. Human DNA here is almost exactly 30% adenine, almost exactly 30% thymine. And again, nearly equal amounts of guanine and cytosine. And this was a pattern he saw again and again with every species that Chargaff looked at. He published his results and came up with what's known as Chargaff's rules. But here's what he concluded. First of all, species all have different proportions of these four nucleotides, and yet the amount of purines and pyrimidines in every organism is equal. He also noticed that the amounts of adenine and thymine were almost exactly equal and the amounts of guanine and cytosine were almost exactly equal. He didn't really know what this meant, but he was on to something, and it was later going to be the last piece in the puzzle that was needed to solve the mystery of the structure of DNA. Now, Chargaff's rules are what he came up with, that somehow he knew that adenine would be associated in some way with thymine, and guanine would be associated with cytosine somehow. Chargaff's rules today, you've heard of ATGC, and if you haven't, you'll hear about it soon enough, so don't worry about it just yet. When Francis Crick and Paul Watson got a hold of Chargaff's research, they pretty quickly figured out the problem and how to solve it. Now, adenine, as you know, is a pyrimidine. It has two hexagons, and it was associated with thymine, which has only one, so that makes a total of three. When they tried to put adenine and guanine together, they had four. Likewise, guanine has two, Cytosine has one. You put guanine and cytosine together, you get three. So their model had been all wrong, and suddenly they realized the adenine fits with the thionine and the guanine fits with the cytosine. When they made their actual metal models of this, all the pieces fit together almost perfectly. If you see anything here that's sloppy, it's just because I'm not good at the graphics. It doesn't mean that their model didn't work. And suddenly they understood the structure of DNA. Adenine always bonds. It forms a hydrogen bond with thymine. Guanine always forms a hydrogen bond with cytosine, and so on down the code. This was the answer to the structure of DNA. Now the takeaway for today, um, you should just be aware that DNA is a double helix, and there's these four nucleotide bases with a sugar phosphate backbone. We're going to be looking at DNA a lot, and you'll, you'll definitely have the intricacies of its structure just pounded into your head over and over again. But it's worthwhile, as soon as possible, memorizing Chargaff's rules, ATGC. Adenine always binds with thymine. Guanine always binds with cytosine. And you might want to make a mnemonic device. I used to say, all teachers go crazy, ATGC. You can think of another one if you want. You can also do TACG. It's the same thing. Now, you should know some of the characters who are involved in this whole discovery process. Gregor Mendel is very important, and we'll be looking at his work again. Um, he uncovered the idea that there's rules for this factor of, an, of heredity. And Hershey Chase basically proved that they're considered be the, to be the ones that proved that DNA was the factor that transforms cells. So just make sure you know about what the Hershey Chase experiment was and what they did. Now even though Watson and Crick and Wilkins shared the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the DNA structure, there were other people who should have gotten credit. And this is the main point, that this is what happens in science. Many people with many approaches lead to the current accepted model. And you can look at almost any scientific discovery, any body of information, and you'll see that a lot of people made contributions, usually over a very long period of time, more than a, a lifetime, more than many lifetimes, to give us the knowledge that we have today. And if you're going to take nothing else away from this lesson, that's what you should learn. Mm -hmm.